John chapter number 8 for the Bible study this evening. This chapter shows Christ in conflict with the Pharisees as he taught in the temple, and it presents a series of contrasts. Um, that's how we'll outline the chapter, the contrast we see. First of all, between light and darkness, that's verses 1 through 20. Secondly, heaven and earth, verses 21 to 30. Then freedom and bondage, verse 31 to 40. The children of God and the children of Satan, verse 41 to 47. And then lastly, honor and dishonor, verses 48 through 59. So let's start by reading verses 1 through 12. Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery, and when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses and the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it being convicted by their own conscience went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even the last, and Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. So I see a picture here, a prophetic picture. Christ coming to the Mount of Olives, then going into the temple early in the morning and delivering an adulterous woman. That's a picture of the second coming of Christ. Zechariah 14, 4, his feet will touch down on the Mount of Olives. Uh, about the adulterous woman, you can look at Isaiah 54, verse 4 to 8. Israel was a, an adulterous woman that he is going to save under the blood of the new covenant and make her his virgin bride. And he comes as the son of righteousness with healings in his wings, Malachi 4, verse 2. And so as we begin this chapter, you see something of a prophetic picture. And it's a tremendous passage. There's much here to consider. And it's a great demonstration of the wisdom of God and of his compassion. And yet there are scholars who claim that John chapter 7, verse 53, that's the last verse in chapter 7, all the way through chapter 8, verse 11, is a forgery that does not belong in the text. And they have reasons why they say that. And the modern versions typically will retain the passage, but they'll put a footnote that says it really doesn't belong here. And they want to cast doubt on the Word of God. And so some of the reasons they'll give is uh, they'll say, well, it's missing in the oldest and best manuscripts. Well, it is omitted in corrupt manuscripts. When they talk about the oldest and best, that's a lie. Uh, they're not the oldest nor the best. Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, and we've talked about this in other studies, those are utterly corrupt manuscripts, and they omit a lot. And, uh, but if you do the manuscript evidence, if you do your study, and I'm not going to bore you with all these details, but it, it is found in the pure line of manuscripts. There, is, there are ancient manuscripts that have this passage. It belongs in the text. And when you do your study on this, you see, uh, if you want to be scholarly about it, you can, like uh, Dean John Bergon, uh, who was a scholar, and he would defend this passage and others. And you can look at all that. Personally, I don't need all that. I, I believe the Bible. I believe God preserved His Word. And I can look in the text itself and see this passage belongs. And, I, and I'll talk about that in just a moment. 
But then they say, well, some of the Greek fathers did not refer to it. Some of the so-called church fathers, they didn't really uh, uh, refer to this passage, so it must not belong. Well, there are other so-called church fathers that did refer to it, but I say about all that, who cares anyway? That makes no difference to me. And then they say, well, it differs in style from the rest of, of the book of John. Now, that's just a subjective opinion. I don't find it differing in style at all. I don't see nothing in it that's like a red flag that says, hey, this is somebody else wrote this. I mean, it fits perfectly in the passage. But even if it does differ in style, it's not uncommon for the same writer to use a different style when dealing with certain things. And besides that, John's writing by inspiration of God. It's God's word. And uh, they also say, well, it doesn't belong here because it promotes immorality. <laughs> what a false accusation to, to say that the way the Lord deals with this woman is somehow taking sin lightly. That, 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 is, that idea is based on a misunderstanding of the passage. Anyone who would make such a ridiculous charge as that is void of spiritual understanding. And that's the issue. You know, some of these scholars, because they don't understand the Word of God, and they don't understand it because they don't believe it, then they try to change it to line up with their misunderstandings. That's what they do, for example, in Romans 8 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. If you study that verse in its context, when it says, They that walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit, that's very important. It's key. And when you look at it in context, it's exactly what it's supposed to say, obviously. But because they don't understand the verse, they try to get rid of that part of the verse. And they do that again and again and again. A Bible believer changes his understanding to line up with the Word of God. He never seeks to change the Word of God to line up with his understanding. Okay, just believe the Word of God. But the Lord was certainly not sweeping her sin under the rug. I mean, he says, what does he say to in verse 11? Uh, uh, go and sin no more. I mean, adultery is an awful sin, and it's condemned throughout the Bible, both Old Testament and New Testament. He's not taking that lightly at all. So that whole idea is just ridiculous, that they would say, well, this passage doesn't belong there because it, uh, take, it, it takes sin lightly. That's, I mean, anybody who would say that doesn't understand what they're reading here. Now, the Bible being the final authority... We need to look to the internal evidence of the Word of God to know whether this passage belongs in the text. Uh, I don't need anything outside the Bible to believe and understand the Bible. I just need to trust God and study His Word, and everything I need is within this book. It is sufficient. So when I look at the internal evidence of the Word of God, it's obvious that this passage belongs in the text. I'll give you some reasons for that. Uh, in the previous three chapters, there was an incident that led to the Lord giving a, dis a discourse, and uh, the same pattern occurs here. Something happens, and then he speaks on that basis. How Christ handled the incident of the woman taken in adultery demonstrates that he's the light of the world, as he says in verse 12, because he exposed the darkness of the Pharisees' hearts, and he called the woman out of darkness to walk in the light of life. And so when he says, I am the light of the world, based on what just happened, that incident was the basis for what he's now going to say. And you see that in John chapter 5 and John chapter 6 and John chapter 7. And then you go into John chapter 9 and he heals a blind man and that sets things up for what goes on in that chapter. I mean, that's the pattern there. If the passage was omitted, the text would jump from a private meeting of the chief priests and Pharisees at the end of chapter 7 to Christ speaking again unto them in the treasury of the temple. <laughs> I mean, you look at the end of chapter 7, there's a private meeting with the chief priests, and Christ is not there with them. They're speaking against him. And there, so you have that private meeting, but then you come into verse 12, then spake Jesus again unto them. What do you mean again unto them? That wouldn't make sense if you didn't have verse 1 to 11. And then in verse 20, these words spake Jesus in the treasury as he taught in the temple. Well, what are you talking about? I mean, that's not how chapter 7 ended. Something happens here at the beginning of the chapter to set this up. So if you take out verses 1 through 11, you mess up the passage. It makes no, I mean, it causes problems. 
And when you tamper with the Word of God, it always causes problems. But I'm going to say this, the wisdom Christ demonstrated in the passage proves it is authentic scripture for no man could have solved this dilemma the way he did. Some man that's just writing on his own and is not writing by inspiration, how would he have been able to handle this situation like Christ did? I mean, if you understand what's going on here, he handled it perfectly and, and dealing with this dilemma. And there's no way, there's just no way some writer at some point just made this up and stuck it in there. I like what uh, A.W. Pink wrote on this. He said, um, let's, I'll give you a quote here real quick. He said, the inc this incident then contains far more than that which was of local and e ephemeral significance. Epif how do you say that? Ephemeral. Man, it means, I know what it means. It means, you know, shortly, you know, just a passing thing. I just, I, there are words I know what they mean, I just can't pronounce them. <laughs> uh, epidural. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, how do you say that again? Ep you know what? I actually, I actually play, played on, you, online, you can get a dictionary that pronounces the word for you, and I played it several times, and I still can't do it. But anyway, but he's an old writer, so he uses these big words. It, in fact, raises the basic question of how can mercy and justice be harmonized? How can grace flow forth except by sliding holiness? In the scene here presented to our view, we are shown not by a closely reasoned out statement of doctrine, but in symbolic action that this problem is not insoluble to divine wisdom. Here was a concrete case of a guilty sinner leaving the presence of Christ uncondemned. And it was neither because the law had been slighted nor sin palliated, which means to pass over without dealing with the root issue. The requirements of the law were strictly uh, complied with, and her sin was openly condemned. That's why he said, sin no more. Yet she herself was not condemned. She was dealt with according to grace and truth. Mercy flowed out to her, yet not at the expense of justice. Such, in brief, is a summary of the marvelous narrative, a narrative which, verily, no man ever invented and no uninspired pen ever recorded. I mean, when I was studying this today and meditating on it, and, and it's just amazing to me how the Lord handled this. And to say this was added and it's not really the Word of God, that's just nonsense. Now, back to the text here. Uh, at the end of chapter 7, verse 53, it says, Every man went to his own house. So the Feast of Tabernacles being over, they had traveled there to Jerusalem, had come into the temple for the feast. But now it's over, they go back to their own house. Jesus, verse 1 of chapter 8, went unto the Mount of Olives. So every man went to his own house, but Jesus went on the Mount of Olives. It reminds me of what he said in Matthew 8, verse 20. Jesus saith unto him, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. In his earthly ministry, he wasn't walking around like a bigwig, some kind of Christian celebrity, you know, uh, throwing his weight around. He was a humble servant. And uh, though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be made rich. And I believe that's talking spiritually, especially when he uh, went to the cross for our sins to give us his righteousness. But also just when you study how he, how he was as a servant, made himself a no reputation, and uh, so he goes to the Mount of Olives. Luke chapter 21, verse 37 tells us, In the daytime he was teaching in the temple, and at night he went out and abode in the mount that is called the Mount of Olives. And so he went to the Mount of Olives, and then early in the morning he comes to the temple, and he's going to teach. And he sat there, which was the customary teaching position for the Jews, uh, in the synagogues and in the temple. Uh, the, the teachers would sit. Uh, maybe we ought to bring that back and start using that. Let me get a stool up here. <laughs> and uh, as long as I teach and preach, I ought to get a chair up here, you know. Uh, but anyhow, so they, they, he, was, he, was, he was sitting there in the temple teaching the people, and, and the, the scribes and the Pharisees interrupted him. They, they barge in right in the middle of his teaching, and they bring in this woman that they say they caught in the act of adultery, and uh, they set her down in the midst of the crowd. 
and they quote the word of God. They cited that Moses commanded in the law that she should be stoned to death. And the law did, did say that in Leviticus 20 verse 10. And the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. And then again, Deuteronomy 22, verse 22, If a man be found lying with a woman married to an husband, then they shall both of them die, both the man that lay with the woman and the woman, so shalt thou put evil away, put away evil from Israel. And so they say, Moses said that this woman ought to be stoned. What do you say about it? So they're challenging him. You know, evil men can quote scripture when they imagine it will further their evil designs. <laughs> I thought about when I was looking at this, because obviously their motive is wrong. They, they don't care so much about the Word of God. They're trying to use the Word of God to accomplish their agenda. They're trying to trap the Lord and come against Him and accuse Him. And I thought about how even the devil quotes Scripture sometimes, don't he? Remember when he was tempting the Lord Jesus and Christ quoted the Scripture? What was the devil's response? He quoted it back. Quoted Psalm 91 and omitted words and took it out of context. <laughs> People, just because someone's quoting Scripture doesn't mean they, they fear the Lord. doesn't mean they believe what they're saying, right? And so they're quoting the Scripture here like they really care about the, the truth and about righteousness. They don't. They're hypocrites. Their wicked motive was to put him to the test and force him into a dilemma. They thought they had, had him trapped. Because if he did not agree that she should be stoned, they would accuse him of being against the law. And keep in mind, Christ conducts his ministry under the dispensation of law. And he said, I didn't come, uh, he said, I came to fulfill the law. In, in Matthew chapter number 5, you remember what he said in Matthew five seventeen. I'm trying to remember myself what it says, <laughs> so I'm going to turn over there. I know, I tell you, man, I used to, it, it's weird. Sometimes I can get to quoting Scripture and it just flows, and, but there are times now in my old age, I start quoting it and then I can't remember what I, uh, you know the thing, anyway. <laughs> Matthew 5, 7, think not that I'm come to destroy the law. That's what I was hunting for. Think not that I'm come to destroy the law of the prophets. I'm not come to destroy it, but fulfill. And so they want to be able to accuse him. Oh, you're, you're coming against the law of Moses. But if he agreed, you know, if, if, if he agreed that she agreed not that she should be stoned, they'd say, well, you're coming against the law. But then if he agreed that she should be stoned, then they would accuse him of not being able to forgive her sin. You know, it said in John chapter 3, in John chapter 3, verse 17, God sent not His Son of the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. And uh, He was a friend of publicans and sinners, and He was showing compassion. And of course He's righteous and He's holy, but He's also merciful. And, uh, and how He was conducting Himself in His ministry, they're trying to find some inconsistency. And they, and they think they got Him on the ropes here. They think they have Him trapped either way He turns. He's stuck between a rock and a hard place, so to speak. That's what they think. But how foolish for men to think they can trap the incarnate Word of God with the Word of God, with the book he wrote. What arrogance and foolishness. There's no counsel or wisdom or understanding against the Lord. Proverbs 21, verse 30. Now, there are some out there that's, that opposes, but the point of the proverb is to say it won't defeat the counsel and the wisdom and the understanding of the Lord. He's the all-wise God. And the Lord knew it was all just a setup. I mean, he, 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 he could tell what was... I mean, obviously, he knows all things. He's the Lord. But he knows this is, this, these hypocrites have put together this setup all in trying to accuse him and trap him. How come they didn't bring the man to be stoned? They're so worried about what the law said. The law said that the adulterer and the adulteress were to be put to death. Oh, they care about the law, do they? Well, if they caught her in the very act, where's the man? i tell you, it's probably one of them. <laughs> probably one of them. Uh, one of these Pharisees that were standing right there, but they, you know, they don't want to, they don't even bring up who she was committing adultery with. 
I mean, it's just, look, it's, it's in the morning. And they catch her in the very act and are able to bring her in before the Lord at the very time he would be in the temple teaching. I, I would imagine most time adultery probably happens at night, not in the morning, but I don't know. It just seems like an odd thing, right? It's a setup is what it is. And they, they orchestrated this. I mean, they, they are desperate, aren't they? they? They have not been able to deal with the Lord. They have not been able uh, to successfully come against Him. And so they're trying everything they can. And the Lord responded by stooping down to write with His finger on the ground as though he heard them not. And by the way, those last words of verse 6 are in italics, and the commentators and the scholars, they, they're offended by it. They say it shouldn't be in the text because it makes the Lord look rude. Well, he was rude sometimes to these hypocrites. You know, he's just ignoring them because he knows they're full of garbage. I mean, that's, basically, that's the updated version. And he said, you're like whited sepulchers. <laughs> You look clean outwardly, but inwardly you're full of dead men's bones. He knows what's going on. And uh, the italicized words absolutely belong in the text. And you notice verse 7, so when they continued asking him, they continued asking him because he was ignoring them. So this idea that says if it's in italics, you can just take it out. No, the, the italicized words are just as authoritative as the rest of them. I believe God preserved his words perfectly in the King James Bible. I'm a Bible believer. I wouldn't change one thing about this book. I believe the italicized words equally with all the rest of the words. And so they, they, he just ignores them and he writes on the ground. And as they continue to ask him the question, he stands up and he invites any of them who are without sin to be the first to cast a stone at her. <laughs> and then he stooped down again to write on the ground again. And so the big question has always been, what did the Lord write on the ground? And I've read all kinds of ideas people have. But, you know, the passage doesn't tell us. So we, don't, we can't be dogmatic about it. But there are other passages that give us some ideas. And I'm, when I come to a question like this, if I can't be dogmatic about it, I'm going to say, well, here's some options. You study it further for yourself and see what you think about it. But I'll give you some options on this of what he might have wrote on the ground. It's possible that he wrote on the ground with his finger twice to remind them of the two tables of the law, which were written with his finger. <laughs> and twice because he might have wrote Leviticus 20, verse 10 the first time, and then Deuteronomy 22, verse 22 the second time. I don't know. But I'm not going to read these references in Exodus. You know he wrote the Ten Commandments with his own finger on tables of stone. And then Israel was committing idolatry, and Moses and anger broke the tables, and God in mercy gave them again. And he, he forgave the children of Israel. You see, the children of Israel sinned. Moses broke the first tables of stone uh, on the ground, but God forgave their sin provided a blood sacrifice, and gave them another set of tables. And so Christ was going to die for the sins of this woman, therefore he was able to forgive her. So it could have been something about reminding them that he, he is the Lord, he is the lawgiver. He wrote that, they're, they're trying to bring up the law like he didn't know what it says when he wrote it. And he gave the Ten Commandments. One of them is, thou shalt not commit adultery. <laughs> he wrote that with his own finger. That finger that wrote the originals <laughs> of the Ten Commandments was the finger of God, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. He is God. And by the way, the originals got broken, but God gave them again. He always uh, preserves his words. Now, another option is it's possible he wrote with his finger on the ground, which he's in the temple, but it would have been a dusty ground, even though stone, and he wrote, so thinking about how he wrote the tables of stone, he's writing on the stone ground. That's what makes me think about the law uh, in the Ten Commandments, but then also that stone ground was, was dusty. He could have been making words in the dust on the ground, and he could have been doing that to remind them of the law of jealousies in Numbers chapter 5, which I'm, you go home and read that. I'm not going to read that whole chapter. I will give you a couple verses from it. Numbers 5, verse 16, the priest shall bring her near and set her before the Lord. This is a woman accused of being unfaithful. Uh, a man can't prove his wife's committed adultery, but he has a spirit of jealousy 
thinking she has. And so he brings her to the priest, and there were certain things that had to take place. And this is the, the first lie detector test, okay? Uh, the, the priest would take some of the dust off the floor of the tabernacle and put it with some holy water, and there were some things he did and that when she drank it, if she was guilty, bad things happened to her. Okay, read the passage yourself. And so the, the priest shall bring her near and set her before the Lord. And the priest shall take holy water and an earthen vessel, and of the dust that is in the floor, the tabernacle, the priest shall take and put it in the water and so on. Go, go home tonight and read that. It's very interesting. But the thing is, the priest shall bring her near and set her before the Lord. They bring this woman in and set her before the Lord. <laughs> of course, they don't believe he's the Lord, but isn't that ironic? He is. And so, if they didn't have the man, they didn't actually have proof of her adultery, and therefore they were applying the wrong commandment. They should have been going by Numbers 5, and they weren't willing to do that. It's interesting. I mean, if you don't have two or three witnesses, they, now they say they caught her in the very act. Well, if so, then where's the man? Without the man, that really hurts their case. Maybe they're lying. Here's another option. And each one of these options, you could do a lot of study on and consider the merits of what, if this is what it was about. But I'm just giving you some ideas here. It's possible he wrote their names on the ground. Jeremiah 17, 13, O Lord, the hope of Israel, all that forsake thee shall be ashamed, and they that depart from me shall be written in the earth, because they've forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. What did the Lord just say in chapter 7? In the last day, that great day of the feast, verse 37, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. He is the fountain of living water. But they have forsaken him. They have rejected him. And it says, All that forsake thee shall be ashamed, and they that depart from me shall be written in the earth. Well, maybe he's writing their names in the dust to remind them of that verse. Here's another option. It's possible he wrote a message of judgment on their sins. Reminds me of Daniel 5, verse 4. Belshazzar having that wicked feast, idolatrous feast. Daniel 5, verse 4, They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and of silver, brass, of iron, of wood, and of stone. In the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand and rode over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Then the king's countenance was changed. It really was a wet blanket on his party, wasn't it? His thoughts troubled him so that the joints of his loins were loose and his knees smote one against another. Like Shaggy on Scooby-Doo with his knees knocking, you know. And you know what it said, thou art weighed in the balances and found wanting. It's interesting, by the way. Now, the scripture, all 66 books, every word of them are given by inspiration of God, but God used men to write these words. Jesus didn't write a book when he was on the earth. He taught much, he said much, but he didn't write Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. <laughs> he used other men. God used men to write the scripture, but there are three occasions that I see in the Bible when God wrote something with his own hand. You have the Ten Commandments in Exodus, you have the, the writing on the wall in Daniel 5, and you have this, Christ walk, uh, writing on the ground in John 8, and you could say that's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and th th there's something to study in those three cases uh, that's, a, that's a sermon in and of itself. But, I mean, he could have been writing, you know, they want to be so high and mighty against this woman, maybe he started writing down their sins on the ground. <laughs> I don't know for sure what he wrote, but whatever it was, I mean, it got their attention. And they were convicted. Now, it says of their own conscience, but why their own conscience? Because their conscience was answering to what the Lord was doing and the Lord gave man. Remember in John 1, he's the true light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Part of that is conscience. He gave every man born in this world the light of conscience and the light of creation. If you receive that light, he'll give you more light. You need the light of the scripture. Christ is the true light. And he says in this passage, I'm the light of the world. 
and uh, they're, they're religious hypocrites, and they're self-righteous, and yet whatever he does here, whatever he writes on the ground, and the way he's handling this, they're convicted. Now, that's a word you don't hear too much anymore. But that, that is, look, it is important that a sinner be convicted. You can't get saved till you know you're lost. And the Spirit of God will use the Word of God to convince you that you're lost and in need of a Savior. That's why Romans, the great doctrinal book on salvation for the age of grace, begins with condemnation on the whole world. You have to know you're not righteous before you'll ever put your tr trust in the righteousness of Christ to be saved by grace through faith in His finished work. There's a lot of so-called preachers today trying to bypass the, the sin issue. Uh, they don't want to be negative, you know. And they don't want to deal with sin and judgment. Let me show you something real quick. Just a little side note here, but it goes along with what we're saying. Look in Acts chapter 26. How did, how did the apostle Paul deal with people? I'm sorry, Acts chapter 24. Acts 24, verse 24. And after certain days, when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. And as he reasoned of righteousness temperance, and judgment to come. God is righteous, and he's saying, you're not. If you know anything about Drusilla and Felix, they were anything but temperate. And then there's judgment to come. He talked about the righteousness of God, showed specifically they were sinners, and therefore they'd be judged if they don't repent, if they don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. As he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled. And answered, go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I'll call for thee. So much for irresistible grace. He did resist it. There's no evidence he ever got saved. But the Lord was dealing with him. But the Lord's not going to make you believe. You've got to choose to believe. Paul didn't go any further with him because if he would not receive the reality of his lost condition and didn't want to get saved, you can't make somebody get saved who doesn't want to deal with the issue, doesn't want to face the fact that they're lost in need of a Savior. And so, uh, again, I can, I, can, I can talk to you about this from Paul's epistles. There is a need for this. When you preach the Word, the Spirit of God will use the Word of God to condemn sinners and show them their need of salvation. Now, we, we have a, a philosophy in the modern church in America that says, let's be seeker-sensitive. Let's, let's be careful not to offend anybody or ever push them away. When a sinner comes to church, they ought to feel guilty and know they need a Savior. They ought to feel condemned. They ought, look, there is a condemnation. You need to know you're lost. You're not helping people by trying to bypass that. The gospel is that Christ died for our sins. You're not preaching the gospel if you don't deal with that issue. He died for our sins and was buried and rose again the third day. People need to know they're sinners and they're lost and there's nothing they can do to be saved. And that's why the Son of God bled and died for their sins on the cross. And they have to put their faith in Him and His finished work. But if you're not lost, why do you need to be saved? And so the Holy Ghost will convince. And that's what Jesus says in John 16, by the way. Look in John 16. John 16. Verse 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it's expedient for you that I go away, for I go not away, the comfort will not come unto you. And if, but if I depart, I'll send him unto you. And when he's come, this is the Holy Spirit, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Does that sound familiar, what we saw with Paul's ministry in Acts 24 there with Felix? Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. The Spirit of God will use the Word of God to show sinners that God is righteous and they're not. And they're going to be under God's wrath if they don't get saved. And so this issue of being convicted, a lot of people today look on that as a negative thing, but I think it's a needful thing. And, uh, I mean, you can't get convicted in the average church today because they're not preaching the Word. If you preach the Word, the Word of God's quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. The Word of God, it, look, the, the Spirit of God will use the Word of God to bring conviction where it's necessary. 
Now, look, there's no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, okay? But if you're not in Christ, you're condemned already. So back to John chapter 8, they, they which heard it being convicted by their own conscience, they went out one by one. Paul talked about the conscience accusing or else excusing, and, and he talked about the conscience in Romans 2. In fact, look in Romans chapter 2, verse 1. You see, they did not have the moral right to condemn the woman. And so they, they all left the scene one by one, and perhaps the eldest left first because he was probably the most convicted because he committed the most sins. And maybe he knew when he was defeated and he had some, at least some of that wisdom about him, but the eldest hung around thinking maybe they'd come up with an answer, but none of them could. They all ended up leaving. But Romans 2 verse 1, talking about the, the hypocritical, unbelieving Jews. Therefore thou art, unex thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest doest the same things. Hey, these Pharisees were guilty of adultery. Christ called that out in Luke 16. There's a lot of people in religion that look so high and mighty and self-righteous, and they come across like, you know, like Jesus said, whited sepulchers. They look white outwardly, but inwardly. Uh, they're just hypocrites, and the Lord knows that they do the same thing. He said, but we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Down in verse 17. <laughs> Behold, thou art called a Jew, and restest in the law, and makest thy boast of God, and knowest his will, and approvest the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law. And art confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness. Instructor of the foolish, a teacher of bays, which has the form of knowledge and the truth and the law. Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God? And Paul is showing here, uh, he, he dealt with the, the, the pagan world being condemned at the end of Romans 1, and then he set up the hypocritical Jews, the unbelieving Jews who thought they were more righteous, and he shows they're also condemned. And so these men bring this woman in, acting like they're so high and mighty, and that uh, this woman needs to be stoned to death. The Lord just tells him, okay, uh, which of you that is without sin, you go ahead and be the first one to cast a stone at her then. And they just all left. They were convicted. There was no more witnesses left to condemn the woman. The law says in Deuteronomy 17, verse 6, at the mouth of two witnesses or three witnesses, Shall he that is worthy of death be put to death, but the mouth of one witness he shall not be put to death. The hands of the witness shall be first upon him to put him to death. Afterward, the hands of all the people, so thou shalt put the evil away from among you. And so you couldn't just make an accusation, you had to prove it. There had to be witnesses, and those witnesses were to be the first ones to take up the stones to kill that person, meaning you better know what you're saying, you stand by what you're saying. But they all left. There was, there was no man there to accuse her and be a witness against her adultery. But Christ knew. He knew about this woman. He knew if she was guilty or not, and she probably was. If not of this sin, of something else, obviously. We're all sinners. And he, being the sinless son of God, had the moral right to condemn her. He had every right in the world to condemn her. But he chose not to. <laughs> Isn't that something? Why? Well, look in verse 11. She said, no man. What? What she call him? Lord? These hypocritical Pharisees said, Master, you know, you're a teacher. We'll recognize you're a teacher. So we got a Bible question for you. But she calls him Lord. She obviously repents in this passage and believes on him. She calls him Lord. And he did not have to condemn her because he knows 
it won't be long from this point, he's going to go to the cross and be condemned in her place. And not only for her, but for the sins of the whole world. I remind you of what it said in John 3, 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Talking about on the cross. That whosoever believes them should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes them should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not His Son to the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. He that believeth on Him is not condemned. He that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Well, did she believe on Him? He has the authority, knowing that He's going to pay for her sins when He could have, by the law, condemned her. See, this is the same God. The same God who gave the law to show man He's a sinner and worthy of death and hell, is also a God of love who came to provide salvation. It's the same God. And He does not condemn her, but instead saves her. And an amazing thing. I mean, He handled this perfectly. He didn't say, oh, who cares what the law says? I'm going to come up with some new teaching here, and I'm going to do it this way. No, He, he, he acknowledged that. And, 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 but the way he handled this thing, those who were trying to say she needs to be stoned, well, according to the law, they need to have the proof and they needed to be willing to cast the first stones because they were supposedly the witnesses. But whenever they left, where are the witnesses? Well, he's the son of God. He knew, but he in mercy is going to not condemn her, not because her sin doesn't matter and he's just going to sweep it under the rug. It's because he knows that he's going to the cross to die for her sins. That's why he's willing to do that. Now, God is just and merciful, not either or, but both. And what a dilemma, but the cross solves that dilemma, okay? How can God be just and justify unrighteous sinners? And he's merciful, and yet he's just. How can both work together? You see it in the cross because sin was paid for, but he paid it himself. Now, that, that is, there's no way man could have come up with this. I mean, when you understand the cross, when you understand what God accomplished, and, and yes, look, I understand where we're at in the context concerning uh, Israel and the gospel of the kingdom, but I, I, I remind you that Israel is going to be saved by the grace of God, not by the keeping of the law. Now, he gave them the law, and the law condemned them. And he's going to bring them under the new covenant when the law is going to be written in their heart because they're going to be filled with the Holy Ghost and their sins are going to be forgiven by his grace because of the blood of Christ. Now, of course, we can apply all this in this age and think about what Christ accomplished for us by his cross, that we're not condemned because we're in Christ. The only way not to be condemned is to be in Christ. And by the way, Israel and the kingdom is going to be in Christ. So I hope you understand, I'm not doing this any justice. It's a deep thing, and you really got to meditate on it, let the Holy Spirit show you. But the way he handles this is masterful, because he is the wisdom of God. You're not going to trap him with his own word. He is just and the justifier of them which believeth in Jesus, Paul said. I mean, that's the age-old question, how can man be just with God? That's what Romans answers. Now, what we find in the book of Romans is not explained here, but the Lord, the Lord knows what he's going to do on that cross, even though it's not all been revealed to them yet. He knows. <laughs> and that's the basis. That's the basis. And so you come into John 8, verse 12. And by the way, he says, go and sin no more. He doesn't show her mercy so she can continue in sin. The Lord will save us as we are, but he won't leave us as we are. He, you know, he, he came to save his people from their sins, right? Isn't that what the scripture says? He didn't come to save his people so they can stay in their sins. He said, I, I'm having mercy on you. And now, and by the way, look at this, man. This is before the cross. Now, let me just say this. Let me just say this. I'm so sick of everybody's excuses about why they do wrong. It's your choice. Just like you choose to do wrong, you can choose to do right. 
And this woman doesn't even have what we have as members of the body of Christ. And he expects her to go. He's not saying she's going to be sinlessly perfect, obviously. But he's saying, you've committed adultery. Stop it! You don't have to keep committing adultery. Right? I mean, it's, it's called just say no. Right? <laughs> but everybody's got all these excuses. Well, you don't understand. And this woman, she's not saying, well, it's the way I was brought up. My father didn't show me much affection, and so I, you know, all this psychological nonsense. She's a sinner, and he has compassion on her, and he's merciful, and he delivers her, but he tells her, now you go forth and quit that nonsense, is what he's saying, okay? No excuse. No excuse. And look, those of us who are in the body of Christ, we have the Spirit of God and the Word of God seated with Christ in heavenly places. Uh, look, we're not under the law but under grace. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin because we're not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Sin shall not have dominion over us because we're not under the law, but under grace. Being under grace doesn't mean now sin is permissible. It means that we have the power through the Holy Spirit of God to walk in victory over it. We're freed from sin, according to Romans 6. Study that. And, and I'm saying that's on the basis of the death, burial, and resurrection. That's on the basis of who we are in the body of Christ. And he tells this woman before the cross to quit doing that. All right, just thought I'd point that out. John chapter 8, verse number 12. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. The Pharisees therefore said unto him, Thou bearest record of thyself, thy record is not true. Jesus answered and said unto them, You are a bunch of idiots. No, that's what, that's what I would have said, but he's very merciful. Though I bear record of myself, yet my record is true, for I know whence I came and whither I go, but you cannot tell whence I came and whither I go. You judge after the flesh. And they were very carnal. Remember he said, judge not according to the appearance in John 7, verse 24. Uh, they're very carnally minded, and they don't have the capacity and the ability to, to render righteous judgment. You judge after the flesh. I judge no man. In other words, he didn't come to judge. He came to save. But he will ultimately judge all men when it's all said and done. And yet if I judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone, but I am the Father that sent me. Remember in John 5, talking about the Father committed all judgment unto him. It is also written in your law, the law that he says that sarcastically because they boast in it, yet they don't keep it, that the testimony of two men is true. I am one that bear witness of myself, and the Father that sent me beareth witness of me. Then said they unto him, Where is thy Father? What an insincere question. They don't care. Jesus answered, You neither know me nor my Father. That's their problem right there. If you had known me, you should have known my Father also. These words spake Jesus in the treasury as he taught in the temple. And no man laid hands on him, although I'm sure they wanted to, because he was nailing their hide to the wall. For his hour has not yet come. They couldn't take him to he's ready to lay down his life. Just a few things here before we close. This is the second of seven I am statements of Christ in the book of John. Remember in John 6, 35, I'm the bread of life. Now here, I am the light of the world. He's going to say it again in John 9, verse 5. I am the light of the world. I am, that's the name of God Almighty. Remember he told Moses, I am that I am in Exodus chapter 3. And so these I am statements of Christ in the book of John, there's seven of them, they prove the deity of Christ. 1 John 1, 5 said that this then is the message which we've heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. They said, we heard, John said, we heard this message from Him, Jesus Christ, that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. When did they hear Him say that? They heard Him say, I am the light of the world. That means He's God, okay? Let there be light. Remember that in John 1, or Genesis 1? Let there be light. The sun doesn't appear to the fourth day. What light is there when he said on the first day, let there be light? That's the light of God Almighty. He is the light of the world. Jesus Christ is God. God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. Darkness speaks of sin and of death. But light speaks of righteousness and life. And you notice the connection between light and life. He that falleth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light 
of life. And so, what an amazing statement. You can, you can really meditate on that and what all that means. We'll come back to it in John 9 because he's going to say it again. I am the light of the world. And it follows then, obviously, that those who follow the light of the world aren't walking in darkness. They're walking in the light of life. And again, he demonstrates it and how he dealt with this situation with the woman taken in adultery. He didn't gloss over her sin and try to sweep it under the rug. He dealt with it. And he exposed the Pharisees in the process and their dark hearts. I'm the lie of the world. Instead of standing in awe at the wisdom of God, the Pharisees continued to reject him and argue with him. The whole rest of the chapter, they're arguing with him like a bunch of fools. And he eats their lunch, man. I love John chapter 8, man. He just, he just boom, boom, just gives it to them right and left. And then the old uppercut. You can just, I mean, he just deals with them so amazingly and, and answering all the stuff they're trying to say. Well, they claimed that since he bore record of himself, it was not true because, you know, the law required two or three witnesses. The Lord brought that up. He's saying, you're saying my record's not true because I bear record of myself. Well, your law, the one you're boasting in, says two or three witnesses. He said, there's another witness. It's not just me. It is my father. Deuteronomy 17, 6, Deuteronomy 19, 5, and there's other places in the, in the law where it talks about the mouth of two or three witnesses, everything being established. Do you remember John 5? I won't turn back there because we're finishing up tonight. But in John 5, he established who he was by four witnesses. <laughs> so it's not just what I'm saying. It's John the Baptist. It's the works the Father sent me to do. It's the Father himself. It's the scriptures. There were, and it's not just the four in John 5 and not just him and the Father in John 8. There, I can show you other witnesses in the Word of God that Jesus Christ is indeed the Son of God. But here he says it's he and his Father's witness and that is sufficient. But since they don't know the Father, they don't know him. And because they don't know him, they can't know the Father. You can't separate them out. That's why it says in 1 John 2.23, Whosoever denieth the Son, the same... Hath not the Father, but he that acknowledges the Son hath the Father also. It, that's their root problem. He said, ye neither know me nor my Father. That's their problem. They're in darkness. Because he's the light of the world. If they don't know him, they don't have the light. And so, as we continue on in John 8, it's fascinating dialogue going on between Christ and the Pharisees. and uh, But we're going to... We're going to stop there tonight uh, in the passage.